Uh, so then, good afternoon. Okay, let, let us begin. So, dear audience, welcome to the lecture of Karoj Tot entitled The Fetishizing Reality, Lukacian Aesthetics and the Chances of Realist Literature. Karoj Tot is a doctoral student of aesthetics at the Utrecht Lorand University in Budapest, Hungary. He earned his master's degree at the Central European University in 2020. <laughs> He focuses on 20th century theories of the novel and literary realism, problems of social engagement in literature, and questions of Marxist aesthetics, with a special regard to Judge Lukács' late work. Since 2018, he's a volunteer of the Lukács Archives International Foundation. Dear Karoy, thank you for accepting our invitation, and the floor is yours. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I, I must warn you, uh, um, because uh, this was a relatively long time ago when I last time uh, speaking English in public, so uh, my skills had to be polished. So uh, in advance, I would like to apologize for uh, any uh, deficiencies of my presentation because of the uh, lack of polished lang skills, language skills. Uh, so as you can, could hear my name is uh, Karo Etot and I'm a doctoral student and, in Budapest uh, and I'm truly grateful to, to be here today and I'm especially thankful to uh, Mark Loschons for all, all of his efforts to make it possible uh, for me to present my relatively vague ideas here today. Um, I must form for you that the main goal of this presentation is to, is, is to give you a concise mismatch of that framework what I intend to use uh, in the following years of my doctoral research. Since I'm kind of new in the town, meaning that I'm a first year doctoral student, I would like to apologize in advance for all of the deficiencies and other possible flows of my presentation. Uh, I, I ask you to be patient and, and help me out at the end by posing any questions. Uh, in the beginning, um, uh, for the sake of being clear as possible, I would like to define basic concepts of my presentation. Uh, firstly, the novel. Uh, secondly, commodity fetishism and reification. Uh, thirdly, literary realism and the reflection theory. And finally, the death fetishizing mission, what Lukács calls as the death fetishizing mission of art. Uh, and after this, I would like to move on and uh, shortly uh, present two, let's say, surprise novels, uh, which might help us to better understand and see the possible future, uh, future chances uh, of this kind of literature. Uh, so to begin with, just give me a second, I would like to share my uh, screen with you. Uh, I hope you, you are able to see my presentation now. Uh, yes, just a second. Uh, so, about the novel. Uh, the novel was and, and still is to be honest, a very problematic and let's say fluid literary genre, uh, since unlike many other European literary genres, it has no proper theory. Uh, this deficiency means, first of all, a certain hardness in defining it. Um, Many of the audience uh, might remember from their school years the rigidly prescribed structure of poems called sonnet. Or just as Hungarians mostly know by heart the fixed conventions of epic poetry, for example, the invocation of the muse, the in medias res style of opening, etc. Uh, despite the fact that the use of the word novel is more of a part of everyday life and speech, than uh, the mentioned other genres, and consequently Mostafesh has a certain intuitive understanding of it, most literary critics and scholars can only agree in its diversity. Uh, this problem encouraged many thinkers, especially in the early 20th century, to make attempts to theorize the novel. Without the intention of being exhaustive, uh, the already mentioned Hungarian philosopher, Gerd Lukács, published uh, his The Theory of the Novel in 1916, 
The British communist Ralph Vincent Fox uh, wrote the novel and the people in the trenches of the Spanish Civil War and it got published posthumously in 1937. The Romanian born French philosopher Lucien Gaumont uh, published Towards the Sociology of the Novel uh, in 1964. Uh, each of uh, these attempts were based on a, a somewhat different uh, philosophical premises, but there is one certain point which is common in almost all of them. Uh, firstly, they all agree that the novel is, is a kind of byproduct of the emerging capitalism. And secondly, a certain worldview is articulated in them. Uh, I will return to the problematic uh, feature of the notion of worldview in the later part of my presentation. At this point, I would like to emphasize the importance of the European origin of the novel. And uh, that when I speak of novels as products of capitalism, I do refer to them as a dominant literary uh, narrative genre. Uh, one might think uh, of uh, some pre-modern examples of relatively long narratives written in prose, like ancient Greek, Latin, or the so-called ch uh, classic Chinese novels. But these examples were rather unique and standalone achievements in their contemporaneous uh, literary landscape. Uh, as opposed to uh, the dominating feature of the 19th century European novel. Um, in the literary circles, one of the rare examples of common agreement is that Cervantes' well-known story of Don Quixote is the first modern novel, the first example of that what most of us tend to perceive as a novel. How this perception is inherently Eurocentric, uh, so we shouldn't forget that the classic novels of the Western literary canon aren't the only novels today and after the 20th century legit enough to be treated by research. Um, before moving towards, again, the novel as we know it uh, appeared alongside capitalism and expresses a certain worldview. Yeah. So let's talk about a bit about commodity fetishism and reification. Um, in his 1867 study of political economy entitled The Capital, Marx describes the distinctive difference between the products of labor and commodities in the following way. Quote, it is as clear as noonday that man, by his industry, changes the form of the materials furnished by nature in such a way as to make them useful to him. The form of wood, for instance, is altered by making the table out of it. Yet for all that, the table continues to be that common everyday thing, wood. But so, so soon as it steps forth as commodity, it is changed into something transcendent and cured. In the capitalist system, uh, goods are not purchased because uh, uh, a purely objective need for them, but rather because of the essence of the mentioned something transcendent feature uh, which make them commodities. But what does this mean? The products of labor as commodities are perceived only through their value expressed in terms of money. Uh, since in our society, everything seems to be able to be expressed in terms of price, we take, take that for granted that it is actually a natural property of things around us. This is more or less what the Marxist analysis calls commodity fetishism, or in praxis, uh, as you might know it from the uh, American series, The Sex and the City, Carrie Bradshaw said, shopping as a way to unleash creative subconscious. To give an extreme yet illustrative example, uh, Please simply think about the duct taped banana sold as art for an unimaginably high price in Miami last December. Uh, the entire problematics uh, of, of things perceived by humans uh, solely as commodities can be understood easily by the comparison on a poster made by the Hungarian ecumenical charity as a reaction to that. Uh, this situation in, in, in most cases is perceived by most of us as normal everything uh, as, as normal every single day, while only theory and some outrageous co uh, cases like the above mentioned one could make us to realize the contradiction between the labor value manifesting itself as a product, for example, a banana sold for 30 cents, or that product sold as a commodity. In this case, the so-called artwork sold for $120,000. 
the disappearance of the difference between these two understanding of the very same object, namely the so-called, uh, namely the so-called reification, is expressed aphoristically by Marx's famous catchphrase from the posthumously published manuscripts of 1844, quote, the devaluation of the world of men is in direct proportion to the increasing value of the world of things, end cured. So let's move uh, to, to realism and the questions of the Lukacian reflection theory. Um, if, if there is any systematic Marxist uh, aesthetic theory, since Marx himself barely or, or did not focus much on, on the questions of aesthetics and art, it must be already mentioned that the Dirt Lukacs two, volu two volume book uh, written in German entitled The Eigenart des Aesthetischen, uh, or, or in English, the specificity of the aesthetic, though I, I have to confess that according to the best of my knowledge, there is no English translation published yet. So Lukács book published uh, his grandiose attempts uh, to theorize uh, the Marxist aesthetics in uh, 1963. Uh, he attempted to articulate a consistent aesthetic theory uh, uh, based on the notions of realism and defetishization as true qualities of as, as qualities of true art. Um, to simplify this to to an extreme, I would say that the defetishizing mission, not very surprisingly, is a way to overcome the above mentioned fetishizing tendencies of capitalism by means of art. Most importantly, by the effect of catharsis. Um, unfortunately, the limits of this presentation uh, do not really allow me to elaborate on the Lukács and understanding of art as such and uh, the different art forms and the numerous problems arising from it. Um, however, I would like to uh, draw attention to the significant difference between traditional aesthetic theories and uh, the, this one, I mean Lukács aesthetics. Uh, firstly, that uh, Lukács um, makes himself uh, very clear in, in the very beginning, in the foreword uh, of, of this work, that uh, centralizing uh, the, the aesthetic interest in beauty is an idealistic mistake. Most of us tend to perceive aesthetics uh, uh, as, as a philosophical discipline, as someone concerned about questions solely about beauty. But Lukács says that it's uh, uh, a problematic limitation of the scope of aesthetic research. Um, and uh, he says, uh, secondly, that, uh, that uh, um, excuse me, sorry. So secondly, uh, Lukács uh, uh, finally uh, summarizes his ideas, uh, what he propagated, propagated uh, from uh, the, the 1930s onwards. Uh, a certain understanding of art, the so-called reflection theory. And this so-called reflection theory is rooted in epistemology. Uh, so to speak, true art is one of the ways to acquire knowledge about the world, or more precisely, the consciousness independent objective reality, at least according to Lukács. Um, so in this, this objective reality is what is reflected in, 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 in two arts. And this is what enables artworks to produce the already mentioned defetishizing effect on people who are consuming them. But um, I will return to this in, in a later part of my presentation. Uh, the notion of, of realism is one of, it must, if it's if not the most let's say polluted uh, word in literary studies in most cases it is used as a reference to a certain bold style of prose the excessive use of nouns over adjectives uh, and so forth one might think about realist literature as a friend of mine living in the fancy part of the hungarian capital because he tends to refer to this this neighborhood in which he lives as the bunch of realist guys as you can 
see the highlighted names of streets, you can find there Nikolai Gogol, Alexander Gertsen, uh, the already mentioned uh, the Balzac uh, or, or, or Victor Hugo, but uh, <laughs> let's not consider the problematic issue of uh, uh, Hugo's degree of uh, being realist in any sense. Uh, and actually, another side note is that maybe it's accidental, maybe not. But uh, uh, on the red, on the spot marked by the red X, uh, there uh, was uh, the statue of Lukács uh, erected and was removed uh, from there in 2017. Uh, but getting back to the questions of realism and reflection theory, uh, probably Lukács' most famous pupil, philosopher Agnes Heller, has said once that his master called every artwork realist if it was significant. But what did count as significant for him? Uh, as Lukács understanding of art is, is analogous with science as, as, as a kind of uh, reflection alongside to some extent with religion, uh, this reflection, it must be understood in an epistemological sense. So, so just remember, we acquire knowledge of reality through the me the, their means. Uh, his realism, uh, therefore, is not what Lukács calls as realism is not rooted in a certain prose style, but uh, but it is an epistemological realism, a way to acquire knowledge. Uh, to make it a bit more plastic, let's say, um, even the most magical novels can be realist in this respect. Just uh, think about uh, the depiction of the banana plantation workers strike uh, with its causes and final crackdown in uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez's 100 Years of Solitude. Despite the current commonplace to call it a magical realist novel, which classification in my opinion is no less shallow and meaningless than categorizing tales on the basis whether they feature animals or not, even Marcus himself has said the following, quote, the trouble is that many people believe that I'm a writer of fantastic fiction when actually I'm a very realistic person and write what I believe is the true socialist realism, end quote. Um, so to, to illustrate this in a more deeper way, I would refer to one of the novels of the French writer Honoré de Balzac. Uh, so despite his, his, let's say, reactionary views, Balzac as a writer was noted and cited favorably by both Marx and Engels, as well as Lukács. Uh, and actually in the 1930s, a relatively famous debate took place in the USSR about whether an artist's social commitment will necessarily result a great artwork, or that can be produced only by someone who is personally totally retrograde. Lukács obviously stood for the latter. So, Balzac's uh, 1835 novel, Father Goriot, uh, according to, to my local friends, uh, belongs to his uh, last popular works in France in comparison with, let's say, The Lost Illusions or The Wild Ass Skin, uh, and despite my expectations, uh, because in Hungary it was and still is a compulsory reading in high schools. According to one of my university professors, uh, this is one of the few long lasting local influences of Lukács because he was able to exemplify his theory by using this novel. Uh, despite uh, the catchiness of the following example, I have to confess that uh, the Lukács published extensively on Balzac's source. I have not found this particular example in his writings yet, yet it still uh, fits for his theory. So one of the key venues of the novel is uh, Madame Vauquier's uh, pension, uh, what you can see on the cover of this edition, and uh, which uh, gets introduced in a really detailed way in the very first chapter of the novel. The rooms on different levels should be rented for different price. Uh, each room has a lower price as you get closer to the roof. Consequentially, the more well-to-do people live closer to the ground, while the less fortunate tenants occupy the higher floors. The titular character, Father Gorio, starts his career as a rich factory owner on the ground floor, but in the time of the plot's beginning, he lives impoverished and close to the attic. By mobili mobilizing this device and put in a very prominent place, namely the first chapter of the novel, Balzac was able to capture the social stratification of the 19th century French and turn it into a kind of easy to get motif. By descending to lower social strata, one will have to make an inverse movement in Madame Vauquer's pension. The Hungarian idiom, falling upwards, perfectly fits with this. 
um, it, this is a way to oversimplified uh, example, obviously, but I think that it shows us the very nature of realism achieved by what Lukács calls reflection. This entirely non-referential element of the novel, since the mentioned building never existed outside of the text, reflects that uh, reflects that social reality, uh, which produced the artwork and the author. However, this reflected picture of the 19th century French society is not simply an outdated blueprint, yet it's still not a historical. This model helps the reader to understand that the social injustice, just like the cheaper or more expensive rooms in the pension, are structural elements of capitalist society. That is why the historical distance between us and Balzac's world did not make this motif outdated. Um, so let's move on to the death fetishizing uh, mission of art. Uh, in, in, in the title, I, um, in the title of my presentation, I promise to tell something about the chances of realist literature, again, realist in a Lukacian epistemological sense. Uh, this was contrasted with the so-called modernist novel of the 20th century. Um, I named authors uh, like James Joyce, uh, Marcel Proust, or Franz Kafka. Um, the already mentioned uh, French uh, um, literary scholar, uh, Lucien Guaman, uh, connected the phenomenon of the already uh, uh, described reification with the questions of the novel in his 1968 presentation at the famous Dialectics of Liberation Conference in London. Cured? In liberal society, reification consisted above all in the disappearance from consciousness of the super individual social totality in favor of an individualism, illusory, no doubt, in as far as it aspired to be absolute, but nevertheless partially real. Today, with the exception of a very few extremely limited uh, ruling circles, men, the individual, finds progressively fewer sectors of social life in which he can still have initiative and responsibility." End uh, in, in, in the 20th century, the novel became strongly polarized uh, between the so-called realist and modernist traditions, as I said in my abstract, and, and later the theoretical and, and political tendencies, especially the, the atmosphere of the Cold War, started to dominate the, so, so um, because of the Cold War, uh, the, the dominant uh, uh, theoretical tendencies in the second half of the century, century started to hierarchize those traditions and started to claim, and, then the, and to claim the inferiority of the realist novel to modernist prose became a commonplace. Uh, this conflict manifests itself in a remarkable way in Paolo Sorrentino's 2013 uh, movie uh, entitled The Great Beauty. Uh, in a scene of a rooftop gathering, a tense conversation between Jap, the one book author of a modernist novella, and Stefania, the so-called socially committed writer, took place. Um, now I want to share this particular scene with you and I hope that you will be able to, 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 to see it. It will be in Italian, but it will be subtitled in English. Questa generazione di giovani mi fa orrore. Mantenuti per anni da questo Stato, appena scoprono di avere due neuroni, prendono e vanno a studiare, a lavorare in America, a Londra, fregandosene di chi li ha mantenuti. Beh, non hanno nessuna vocazione civile. Io da ragazza a lettere occupata grondavo vocazione civile. Tu grondavi vocazione civile? Sì, perché? Lo lasciamo perdere. Ma che ne sai tu? Tu in quegli anni eri a Napoli a fare il vitellone insieme alle ragazzette borghesi e a scrivere il tuo unico romanzetto. Una grande storia mi passava accanto e io non me ne accorgevo. Scusa, romanzetto. Mi ha segnato la storia della letteratura italiana, lo chiami romanzetto. Posso confermare che già per la vocazione civile non sono mai andati tanto d'accordo. Lui era pigro, l'altra iperattiva. Ma dai, Romano, piantala di fare sempre le fuse al tuo idolo. Sei patetico. E questo Jack lo sa benissimo, è tanto vero che ha evitato di scrivere altro. Scusa, tu invece? Io ci ho provato a cambiare le cose con la letteratura. Sì, Io ho scritto autore. 11 romanzi di impegno civile sì. e il libro sulla storia ufficiale del partito. Hai dimenticato la collaborazione dei testi di quelle reality, come si chiama? La fattoria delle ragazze si chiama. Guardate che l'esperienza della televisione è molto formativa. 
e quando mi invitano io ci vado sempre. Io mi sporco le mani, io sperimento, provo e non passo la vita a fare la snob. Senti un po', stai dicendo che un romanziere impegnato ha una sorta di vantaggio, diciamo, di salvacondotto rispetto al romanziere che si occupa, che ne so, di, di sentimenti. Ma certo che sta dicendo Cittadina, questo. La causa certo. per la quale uno impegna la propria vita non è secondaria. Metti l'importanza di costruire una famiglia, di dedicarsi con sacrificio e impegno quotidianamente all'educazione dei ragazzi. Io e Eusebio abbiamo quattro figli, facciamo insieme un percorso, progettiamo. Io faccio i salti mortali per essere madre e donna, ma alla fine della giornata sento che sono stata utile, che ho fatto qualcosa di interessante, di importante. E noi invece che non abbiamo figli, secondo te dovremmo accarezzare l'idea del suicidio? Ma non parlo di te naturalmente. Parla di me. Cittadina, lo sai quanto ti stimo, no? Tu sei una donna cazzuta. Usi cazzuta in uno dei tuoi undici romanzi. Sì, uso la parola cazzuta nei miei romanzi, ci prova ad essere moderna. La modernità è cazzuta. De gusti, quante certezze, Stefania. Non so se invidiarti o provare una forma di ribrezzo. Sì, ho delle certezze. Ho 53 anni. Portati bene in mondo. Ho 53 anni, ho sofferto, mi sono rialzata e adesso ho imparato molte cose dalla vita. Bene, vedo che non ribattete più finalmente. Salve. Stefa, non ribattiamo perché ti vogliamo bene, non ti vogliamo mettere in imbarazzo, ma insomma tutte queste vanterie, tutta questa ostentazione seriosa di io, 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 questi giudizi sprezzanti tagliati con l'accetto, nascondono una tua fragilità, un tuo disagio e soprattutto una certa serie di menzogne. Noi ti vogliamo bene, ti conosciamo, certo conosciamo anche le nostre menzogne, ma proprio per questa differenza tua... Finiamo per parlare di vacuità, di sciocchezzoni, di pettegolezzi, proprio perché non abbiamo nessuna intenzione di misurarci con le nostre meschinità. Ma di che menzogne stai parlando? Tutto quello che ho detto è vero, è come sono, è quello in cui credo. Ti prego, mi vanto di essere un gentiluomo, non mi fa crollare l'unica certezza che ho. No, eh? no, 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 adesso tu per favore mi dici quali sarebbero le mie menzogne e le mie fragilità, bello mio. Eh? Io sono una donna con le palle, parla, avanti, su, parla. Su donna con le palle crollerebbe qualsiasi gentiluomo. Stefa, l'hai voluto tu, eh? In ordine sparso. La tua vocazione civile ai tempi dell'università non se la ricorda nessuno. Molti invece ricordano personalmente un'altra tua vocazione che si esprimeva a quei tempi, ma si consumava nei bagni dell'università. La storia ufficiale del partito l'hai scritta perché per anni sei stata l'amante del capo del partito. I tuoi undici romanzi pubblicati da una piccola casa editrice foraggiata dal partito, recensiti da piccoli giornali, vicini al partito, sono romanzi rilevanti, lo dicono tutti, questo non toglie che anche il mio romanzetto giovanile fosse rilevante, su questo ti do ragione. La tua storia con Eusebio. Ma quale? Eusebio è innamorato di Giordano, lo sanno tutti, da anni, pranzano tutti i giorni da Arnalda al Pantano, sotto l'attacca Pantano, le tue innamoratine, sotto alla quercia, lo sanno tutti e fate finta di nulla. L'educazione dei figli che tu condurresti con sacrificio minuto per minuto. Dopo tutta la settimana in televisione, esci tutte le sere, pure il lunedì, quando non si manifestano neppure gli spacciatori di popper. I tuoi figli stanno sempre senza di te, pure durante le vacanze lunghe che ti concedi. Poi hai per la precisione un maggiordomo, un cameriere, un cuoco, un autista che accompagna i ragazzi a scuola, tre babysitter, insomma... Come e quando si manifesta il tuo sacrificio? Queste sono le tue menzogne di fragilità. Stefano, madre e donna, hai 53 anni, una vita devastata, come tutti noi. Allora, invece di farci innamorare, di guardarci con antipatia, dovresti guardarci con affetto. Siamo tutti sull'orlo della disperazione, non abbiamo altro rimedio che guardarci in faccia, farci compagnia, pigliarci un po' in giro. O oh no? Uh, yeah, so um, uh, what is what is the keyword in this scene uh, to to um, so we have to a bit distance ourselves uh, from 
the personal uh, the, the certain personal details of, of this uh, enhanced conversation and focus on the keyword used by Jeff, fragility. Nowadays, both the mainstream uh, both, both the mainstream theory and and, and the, the, the actual production of literature uh, seemingly uh, reflects uh, to 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 the to to Francois Lyotard's uh, aphoristically defined postmodernism. So to say, uh, an incredulity towards meta narratives, and this statement has crucial consequences for the novel uh, because of. Uh, the basis of, uh, for the dominant critical understanding of the genre, as I was saying before, was the interpretation of the novel as a manifestation of a certain worldview. In this sense, the novel lost its ability to capture uh, uh, to capture uh, broad aspects of the society in different times and places, um, in, in a way to describe the social, cultural, and political dimensions of the everyday relations. And, this is the first crack, the first manifestation of the fragility mentioned by Jap in the movie. Uh, the opposition of modernism and realism is a model divergence uh, to two directions. The realist tradition uh, provides a mimetic representation, uh, so to say, uh, the, copying the world in an Aristotelian sense, in the form of, of a plausible narrative. Uh, in contrast with uh, the textualness or textual feature and the individuality of uh, literary modernism, which became more dominant feature of the, the novel genre in the second half of the century. Naturally, these are not two distinctive sets, but, but two extremes to which the literary production, especially in Europe, diverged to. Uh, the interplays and both the direct and indirect connections between their authors are able to prevent us from, from uh, imagining two totally different text universes. But simplifying to, this to an extreme nowadays, it seems more axiomatic to, to say that, that, that works of authors like uh, uh, Kafka, uh, Joyce or Proust are beyond the aesthetic possibilities of those written by Louis Aragon, Maxim Gorky or Thomas Mann. Um, probably very few of us is familiar, if any, with the two novels I'd like to briefly introduce now to discuss the chances of the future of the novel. Um, the peculiar choice is driven by two factors having a crucial significance of the theories and concepts presented already. Uh, we can talk about the novel as a gradually uh, globalized, therefore less and less exclusively European literary form of modernity. That's the first question. And secondly, what are the possibilities of the novel after that strong polarization experience in the last century? For these reasons, I've chosen uh, the Chinese writers Dingling's 1948 novel, The Sun Shines Over the Sangan River, and an experimental so-called collective novel from Austria entitled Volen Shon, uh, published about four years ago. Um, to start uh, with the previous, uh, I'd like to say a few words about the background of my choice of a relatively unknown Chinese novel. Um, there are reasons for that. Uh, firstly, uh, Ding's novel isn't set and or written in Europe. The writer is a woman. Uh, the backdrop, or more precisely, the social basis of the plot is an event, is an event uh, affecting the lives of approximately half a billion people, namely the Chinese land reform uh, after the Second World War. And none of these is a kind of regularly recurring element uh, in the canon of great European novels, not to mention that it's not simply a well-known text in mainland China, but it's, it, it also uh, got... Uh, uh, relatively well trans it also good to be a relatively well translated work uh, after receiving the most prestigious Soviet literary award at the time the Stalin Prize in 1951 and subsequently it was translated to many European languages like Hungarian and Serbian um, while I was probably more than missing numerous cultural references of the work and not being able to enjoy it in the original language, I was stunned by the interplay between the very localized action described in the novel and the so-called holistic big picture, namely the panoramic examination of the back then recent history. 
Um, unfortunately, my lack of confidence in presenting any piece of Chinese fiction without a proper background knowledge of literary history, and also for the limits of the given time for this presentation, uh, left limited place for the analysis now. Uh, so for this reason, I would like to present only a very small section from one of the last chapters of the novel. Spoiler alert, by this part, the land formerly owned by landlords got distributed. Um, so this section is dealing with a rather complex situation. Uh, I can't really go into details now, but, but if you are going to read only one book in your life about the socialist agricultural reform, then this should be the one, not the stereotypical Soviet examples, uh, because Ding's book shows the complexity of the reform, not only on a class uh, struggle level, but uh, the manifestation of the very problematics of swift social changes on a very nuclear level of a society by having many of his characters related to each other as family members, despite the fact that they belong to different social classes. So in the 51st yeah, the 51st chapter, two well-to-do peasants met shortly after the local launch of the land reform. Gu Yong, or as he usually called by other characters, Old Gu, uh, accidentally bumped into his, bumped, uh, uh, bumped into his uh, elder daughter's father-in-law, Hu Tai, uh, another uh, middle uh, peasant living in another village. So Old Gu feels uneasy because of the ongoing swift social changes and do not want to give up his land. Uh, it's worth to note that the, the process of the land distribution described in the novel is really complex. Uh, for instance, some of the owners expected to cooperate and hand over their property voluntarily because of the lack of legal framework and ongoing civil war and subsequently the lack of law enforcement. Uh, through decades of serious and deep self-exploitation, Olgu was able to effectively accumulate enough wealth to buy land on his own, and he started to hire seasonally landless uh, started to hire seasonally landless peasants only in the very last years. Uh, he is respected universally by the village people as a decent self-made man, so he feels it unjustifiable when he's asked to hand over some of his land voluntarily. Uh, the novel ends without telling the ultimate result of his encounter with uh, Hu Tai. However, the explanation of someone having the exact same class interests as he does is rather convincing. Quote, Hu Tai said that it would not hurt a family like his to give up a few land. If they had too much land, they couldn't cultivate it all themselves and would have to hire laborers. And now the wages were high. It wasn't worth it, end quote. So in terms of of a worldview presented in the novel, Huta is expressing the curse of history. The form of accumulation of private ownership, uh, or the, the, form, uh, the form of accumulation of private ownership of land is getting outdated exactly because of the results of the land reform. Uh, that is, that the, the formerly landless peasants could be hired only for higher wages now. So the whole form became unsustainable. Giving up superfluous land in this sense became getting rid of it since its cultivation as private ownership, uh, the cultivation as private ownership uh, becomes impossible. So this is the point when the question of royalties becomes crucial. The statistical agriculture, moreover, even historical truths of the narrative might be contested by experts of these fields. Or you can read it as an unrealized utopia, which can be contrasted rather unfavorably with the 21st century social realities of China shaped by socialist market economy. Uh, but what should be appreciated is, is what the already mentioned, uh, what, is, uh, what is the already mentioned uh, Lithian Goldman calls the introduction of a unified rigorous structuration into a rich and complex world. Goldman uses the word the, the word world vision or in the origin of French vision du monde uh, to describe what is organizing the universe of all great literary work, what he calls this all great literary work. Um, wrote, for the work of art to be truly great, one must however be able to find it also an awareness of values rejected and even repressed by the vision which makes up the unity of the work and the awareness of the sacrifices which men have to suffer because of the refusal and repression of these values." End quote. However, uh, Goldman, not seeing any further perspectives, uh, was, was rather pessimistic about the possibilities of any 
uh, uh, literature uh, in uh, with the alongside the development of capitalist society, and uh, this this since his this pessimism he, he was being pessimistic in the late sixties. I can't really outsmart him with a novel written in uh, nineteen forty eight, even if it's not from Europe. So that's why I choose another uh, novel entitled uh, Volenchon. Um, upper, uh, upper friend's uh, recommendation, I've uh, visited the Cafe Gagarin during my stay in Vienna back in 2016. And while having a drink in that famous leftist bar, I've noticed the sticker with four words on it, Collective Roman Volenchon. Uh, Later on, I was able to figure out that actually it's the title of a non-mainstream experimental novel written in German as a co-production of 11 mostly Austrian uh, uh, writers uh, who worked on it for three years. Um, actually, the title itself hardly translatable to any language uh, since the most self-evident way is to interpret it as a, a pendant sentence. However, in this case, the verb wollen to want uh, can be both understood as we want or they want, and shown means already. Uh, so this, this non-conventionally structured and non-linear narrative tells the story of 10 intellectuals involving all of them as narrators who got the chance to reside in the so-called Free Institute. The Institute was established by one of them called Hanna Wormuth uh, upon inheriting a manor and 2 million euros from a mysterious professor, Manfred Meywald. She barely knew him, but once they had a conversation in which Mevald accused her and her generation. He wrote, do you know what is your problem is? For actually, you do not want to be free, none of you, and he wrote. Accepting the bat from beyond the grave, uh, uh, Hannah uses the funds inherited uh, uh, from Mevald. Uh, to uh, invite nine intellectuals from all around the world and provide them freedom by abolishing their financial dependency. For three years, they are living together in the utopian world and doing free research. And actually the rest of the novel is a little bit less interesting than the premise itself. The characters of the novel are trying to uh, answer questions imposed on them by both uh, the unique opportunity, Maywald's uh, uh, um, a judgment and the society political conditions dominating the world outside of the Free Institute. Uh, in, uh, in his will, in his final will, Mayfeld expresses uh, that in his opinion, uh, Hanna Wormuth won't be able to change anything. And this problem isn't solved really by the novel at all. However, open by thematizing this problem, the novel took a great leap forward to achieve uh, because to achieve this, the novel lapses into experimenting with many literary engines, like uh, employing different narrators, and even sometimes narrating in foreign languages or in, in written forms of dialects. Uh, and, and sometimes it makes a bit really un inaccessible uh, to the broader audience. And, and also experiments with different text formats and so forth. I might have considered this novel rather interesting than a great one, keeping in mind that being interesting is not uh, really an aesthetical category. But in his already mentioned book, uh, Towards the Sociology of the Novel, uh, Goldman defines uh, the given literary work of art as a meaning carrier structure. And that's the way how we should interpret this, this experimental novel. So this structure, namely the novel, uh, evolved in the context of numerous interplays between ideological, political, social, and economical structures of the society. Uh, on the theoretical basis, Goldman argues that the novel as the most representative literary product of capitalist society, uh, as, as he tends to, to, to formulate uh, the novel in the foot, following the footsteps of Lukács, the novel manifests symmetrical and analogous structural features with capitalist economic system. Goldman himself was convinced that the representatives of the 19th century, uh, 19th representatives of the 1960s French literary movement called Nouveau Roman, or that is the new novel, uh, that they expressed the primary laws of the so-called outer world, that is the social reality of developed, developed Western societies. 
his main the main examples of uh, of uh, novels written uh, the main examples the main uh, most of Goldman's examples are coming from novels uh, written uh, by one of the most uh, important and then the uh, vital known author of this uh, French new, uh, uh, movement called uh, Alain Robillier. And uh, he says that, uh, for example, I showed that the erasers by Robrier transposes into an imaginary world of one of the fundamental mechanisms, mechanisms of contemporary society and of organizational capitalism, economic and social self-regulation. That's the, his novel, The Voyeur, centers on the passivity of men, which is one of the fundamental facts of contemporary industrial societies. And his novel, The Jealousy, centers on reification and so on and so on and cured. The main question, therefore, is whether it is just another transposition uh, of uh, this, this literary plane uh, of the everyday life in, in the individualistic society created by market production, or maybe this novel by experimenting went beyond uh, just thematizing these questions and provided a possible new, let's say, collective form of the novel. Goman argues that in the center of the classical or first, let's say, European form of the novel, which has evolved in the initial stage of capitalist development, is the autonomous or problematic hero is in the center, which is alien to its surroundings, but unable to detach her or himself from it. For example, Julien Sorel in Stendhal's The Red and the Black. The second stage in the development of the novel is characterized by the disintegration of this central personality, like in case of uh, uh, the uh, main character of Sartre's Nausea, Anton Ropantin. Uh, and in the third, the late capitalist phase, the novel begins dominated by the autonomous world of things. The, for example, like the title or object in Georges uh, Perec, uh, the things. The main feature of this process is the more or less radical disappearance of the character, uh, uh, and uh, and and the which corresponds with it, the 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 um, the emerging autonomy of object. Objects. Uh, so, in my interpretation, by using these three stages, Goman describes the process of uh, reification on the literary plane of a social reality. Since the starting point is the autonomy of the individual, which is replaced by the autonomy of things. Just remember what Marx was saying about the devaluation of the world of man. So, as as I've previously said, Goldman is rather pessimistic about the future of the novel, but upon Considering that, firstly, the nouveau roman uh, culminated in the paradigmatic yet gradually ended tradition of the French new wave cinema cinematography, and secondly, the partial success of uh, Bolenchon in reflection of socio-economical uh, relations through the fates of precarious academic workers, there might be still perspectives for it. Um, so to so, so to con conclude, what I wanted to say. Um, before, before really harshly judging me for reducing novels to mere reflections of land reforms or underfunded young scholars, I'd like to underline that the literary text works on many different levels. That's true and undeniable. Um, the already mentioned pupil of Lukács, Agnes Heller, said once that first the Engels claimed that he, he have learned uh, more from Balzac's works about economics than from any other monographs. And Lukács said, uh, to, said to her the, the very same about Balzac's novel called The Peasants. But Heller always wondered why they turned to fiction and not to economic records if they wanted to know economics better. The answer's key word is reflection, which makes us able, uh, which makes the reader to be able to comprehend not simply certain socio-economical relations, but the very implications of material conditions in human life in general. Uh, the German writer Arnold Zweig, Arnold, not the more famous Stefan, uh, held a presentation in 1948 about the future of the novel. Uh, Zweig uh, will make an, so in the queue, Zweig makes a mention of Effie Briest. Uh, she's a titular character from Theodor Fontane's classic uh, 1894 novel, a quasi German Madame Bovary. Uh, so Zweig said, uh, Kjord, the novel has to be understood as a form. 
in which the structure of being is transformed into the structure of plot. Nothing is present in the productive entities embedded in human imagination, which sooner or later cannot be realized if we create the conditions in order to find the way of transforming our coexistence. That is why the writing of novels has, or at least, have an essential transforming and cultivating meaning of social significance. Although it is far from, uh, far from me to bring an educational element into art, the more transparent we make the fate of an ephibrist, the clearer it will be for people to behave more meaningfully and therefore more humanly with their fellow human beings. And the humanization of human beings is a task for which no art is too noble." End cure. And what is already present in Zweig's Ars Poetica, let's say, uh, later found its theoretical articulation in the chapter on the defetishizing function of art in Lukács aesthetics. I do believe, however, that the work is far from being done because you can be that dogmatic to take everything for granted what Lukács has said or wrote, at least because there are profound uh, and deep differences between the world in which his works were created and our contemporary social realities. However, the central problem addressed in his works, namely the dehumanizing effect of capitalism more relevant than ever, and everyone dealing with literary studies should be concerned about it. Well, Thank you very much for your uh, attention. Uh, and yeah, now I'm ready for your questions. Okay, thank you very much, uh, dear Karoy. Uh, dear audience, if you want to ask any questions or make uh, comments, uh, please let me know in our chat section or simply uh, turn on your camera and microphone and simply say something if you want to. Um, okay, for the beginning, let me ask you a question, Károly. Do you hear me? Yes, you do. Okay. I don't hear you at the moment, but it's not a big problem. <laughs> no, I hear you. <laughs> okay. Uh, so please explain me something if, as if I were a five-year old child okay so we have here the theory of fetishism in marx capital um, it was uh, introduced in marx capital after the paris commune so in the first edition that chapter wasn't included it's a very interesting chapter um, in fact, the whole theory of fetishism is embedded in Marx's value theory. As it is well known, it is suggested that the relations between socialized individuals appear because of fetishism as relations between things and not vice versa. That is perhaps the basic uh, thesis of Marx. Now, uh, there are, of course, uh, further implications of this value theory that workers have, have no uh, control over production, that wage itself is imposed irrationally on uh, social relations from the perspective of, so of socially necessary labor as fiction. And the same goes for uh, on, on a further level uh, for market relations demand, supplies, and price. All these things are, in fact, um, imposed, defined behind the backs of the producers. Uh, this is how Marx's famous formulation goes. Now, in principle, this is this whole thing, fetishism and value production is independent from classes, in principle. For instance, Marx imagines uh, situations Situation, situation when we have only one state as the only owner of every capital, but uh, even though there are no classes, capitalist value production and fetishism goes on. Now, my question is, what is the exact uh, relation of fetishism to literature? So obviously, uh, the content is very important. Certain novels illustrate how uh, social 
individuals are alien to their surrounding environment. So in this case, fetishism is presented within the content of the literary work. I hope that I'm right. Now, on the other hand, my question is, what about the form, the literary form itself? So is the writer herself or himself alienated from the production, from the production of the artwork? Uh, or uh, Lukács suggests that the artist is simply an authentic uh, agent. So I, am, I hope that I understand well that there is a need to, de de to de 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 fetishize capitalist uh, social relations with regard to the content of the literary work, so to, to de fetishize all these different functions. But my question is, so I wonder whether Lukács tries to de fetishize the role of the writer herself or himself as someone who also produces something within the capitalist society. I hope my question was not too confusing. Uh, and turn on, on your microphone, of course. Yeah, uh, okay, so... Um, uh... Well, first of all, I, I, I have to, 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 to um, I have to confess that I didn't know that uh, this chapter of the capital was included later, especially after the Paris Commune, because it's really interesting than this case. Uh, but what is interesting about literature that uh, there is a twofold understanding of it. So literature, uh, as it appears to us, is also a form of commodity. So as we buy tickets for movies, as we buy books, and so forth. Uh, what gets defetishized, and I, I just only made a, um, a really uh, short remark to it. So uh, what Lukács, uh, he uh, introduces a novel understanding, or at least a more broad understanding of catharsis. And this is the effect uh, uh, which, uh, which uh, helps the reader uh, to defetishize reality. So in this case, the role of the author as a producer as an authentic agent of the literary creations, it's not irrelevant, but in this relation with the work and the reader, it's not that important. Um, yeah. Um, you know and... why I am asking it, this? Because uh, we have the aesthetics or anti-aesthetics of Pierre Bourdieu, who tries to analyze art as an institution, as uh, as a domain of hierarchies, of, of uh, the domain where struggles for being an artist go on. So there is a there are conflicts between different producers. So this is a, a possible perspective, I think. And I wonder whether Lukács mentions it at all or not. No, not not at all. And and uh, so. Um... What is so, so what as far as I know, but I, I have to confess I have a li really limited understanding of, of uh, Bourdieu and his uh, psychological approach. But what I, what I what I do know it's like two theories which can let's say accommodate each other. Uh, but more importantly, the, the keyword in in uh, in Lukacs is uh, is uh, uh, the work of art. So he totally uh, frees the work uh, works of art. Uh, uh, from 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 any intention, if there is. So, like as I mentioned, there was this uh, uh, debate in the uh, the USSR in the thirties that uh, what can we do uh, with with works like uh, Balzac, who was a royalist, uh, anti-republican, and still like he was uh, the chronicler of uh, uh, um, uh, emerging capitalism, uh, or. Uh, uh, so, so what, what, what I can, what I can uh, say to you? Sorry, I just had to get together my thoughts. Um, what I, what I wanted to say that uh, he, he mostly um, uh, disregards uh, the role uh, of an author. He not really theorizes his role in the production of uh, 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 the uh, literary creation. Uh, 
in when in his youth when his pre-marxist period he deals with that but later on it gets a totally different perspective um but it doesn't mean that anybody can be a writer or something but um i think this this would be, would lead us further than necessary so uh the the death fetishizing as an act took place through the means of the 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 literary works which produces the effects of uh, catharsis. Lukács has um, um, an understanding of, of this catharsis he, uh, in, in, in a really German and, and idealistic way. I didn't want it to mention it because I think it would make it very, very unnecessarily complex uh, uh, to, to explain the basics of his ideas. But, but he says that uh, upon uh, uh, enabling uh, Upon the, the 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 reader has access to uh, this uh, the fetishization through the means of catharsis, the whole human being will uh, transform and transcend itself to the uh, uh, the wholeness of of the whole human being uh, will transform to the wholeness of being human. Yeah. So um, yeah. Uh, so what so what what I wanted to the, want wanted to say and 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 express that the role of the author here does not uh, uh, really count because whenever we start to deal with it, especially as for example Bourdieu does, uh, we will end up as one of the consumer uh, one of the the producers of commodities. That's true, but the art artwork his feature its being of its feature of being an artwork transcends this commodity feature. So this, by the fact that you pay for the book, you might get this anti-capitalist, the death fetishizing and humanizing effect well, through reading it. Um, yeah, maybe I, I should have elaborated a bit better, better in this. I'm not sure that now I'm able to, 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 to present these ideas in, in their fullest extent. So um, I'm saying sorry for, for any Lukács expert being here now. <laughs> Thank you very much for your answer. Uh, are there any further questions or comments? Anybody? I don't see any comments in the chat section. Okay, Jan Harvat, uh, could you please turn on your microphone or? Uh, uh, yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Karoj, for the uh, very good presentation. My question would be maybe a bit uh, unorthodox. Uh, I would like to ask uh, what would be in uh, your uh, understanding the relation that uh, Lukács might have, of course, I, I guess it's like we all know what he, he might have thought, but uh, what he, uh, he might have thought of the graphic novels uh, as of today, because on one hand, uh, we can see this uh, fetishization uh, within the productions of uh, uh, novels themselves. But uh, if we look at uh, graphic novels that are not uh, countercultural graphic novels, then, uh, for example, in the United States, they have a clear intention in a way, uh, being either propagandistic or just uh, having as much sales as possible. Sometimes novels only accompanying uh, very big Hollywood movie flicks. Uh, and so on and so on. So uh, would he consider graphic novels as an artwork in this keyword that you were speaking about? This would be my question. Well, thank you very much for your questions, first of all. Um, I have to elaborate a bit on the, on the background before uh, saying what I uh, think about it. The thing is that it's, it's, it's um, Traditionally, Lukács' whole uh, works are uh, get categorized as the the young, the idealist one, and the later Marxist one. Though there are many modifications uh, uh, from his uh, from the very beginning of uh, from his Marxist uh, turn until the end of his life, after the years of writing the aesthetics, um, and uh, well. <laughs> Uh, he, I mean, maybe I will roll over uh, his grave now, but but I must say that he got liberalized. Uh, in in the thirties, he introduced this uh, concept of great realism. In he expected to 
to to that with the, the social realities of uh, emerging socialism in the USSR will uh, make the the new uh, epic uh, poems, new great novels. But later on, he he uh, the the actual uh, realities of uh, literary production uh, let, let him believe that uh, that that maybe it's it's not the way, and he. Uh, uh, got more tolerant with uh, with other forms uh, of literature. So what I wanted to say, and yeah, even more importantly, what I want to say is that when I talk about novel, it's my limitation. It's not Lukács's limitation. He talks about art. And whenever he talks about art, especially in the aesthetics, he tries to be exhaustive. The, I don't remember that he treated comic books or graphic novels or, or anything like this, but he, he says he, in his understanding of art, film, painting, music, everything what is commonly understood as art is incorporated. Uh, and, uh, and Lukács uh, said, and, and I, uh, so uh, what I wanted to say that when, when Lukács uh, finally gave up after the end of the Second World War, uh, gave up this idea of great realism, uh, he still thought that the novel is somewhat more important device uh, of uh, defetishization. Um, and, uh, but but, but uh, he, he said that, that there is, so there were no formal prescriptions for, for what can be done, or uh, he especially uh, was, was against this kind of what, uh, what Germans say, this Zukunftsmacherei, that, that, that uh, making uh, some kind of vision of the future. So that was the reason why he, he limited himself to analysis of actual existing literary works. So in my opinion, despite the fact that, I don't know, like if, if uh, he, he look actually avoided to 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 pose questions based on the existence of mass production of narratives or or uh, this mass media uh, at all. Uh, but but I do think that on the basis of his theory, it 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 can uh, the graphic novels can be uh, incorporated. Um, I'm I have to confess that I have really limited uh, knowledge uh, uh, in, in in graphic novels, but I do remember once uh, someone that's uh, back at CU shared me uh, with. Uh, well, it wasn't an illustrated version. It, it, it was put into narrative, like Marx's Capital was made into a comic book, and and that was really interesting. But I, I have to be honest, and and I never thought about it. But I do think that this this. Like, like clearly and explicitly said, uh, uh, flexibility and it, this this internal dynamics of Lukács aesthetic theory would enable it, I think. Well, thank you very much once again, uh, dear Karoy, and thank you very much, dear audience, for following us. Goodbye. Thank you very much and goodbye.